I first put this uh, presentation together, I was thinking about how it's uh, shale gas is reshaping the uh, U.S. chemical industry, but it's far more than that. It's about how shale gas is reshaping global industries. Everything is going to be affected. And if you don't take anything else home tonight, take that home. I want to take you back to 1973. And uh, many of you lived through that period of time, the oil shock, the first OPEC embargo that occurred. For me, it was very, very dramatic. Uh, see, my father uh, was a great car aficionado. And we lived up in Massachusetts. And the first car that I remember driving in was a two-seater German convertible. And uh, it was a crazy car to have in Massachusetts, because due to the weather, uh, you know, it, it, it made no sense. It had barely had a heater. We had a family of five, and it's a two-seater. Um, when it rained, the, 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 heart, the top that came up leaked like a sieve, but it was glorious for one month a year. The other car that really impacted me that I remember was my dad got a late uh, late 60s Dodge Charger with big block V8. It was red. I loved that car. Uh, see, I was uh, just getting, I was in high school, just ready to get my driver's license. And I, the, my father owned the car, the car owned me. I would wash that car once a week. I would wax that. I had visions of going into high school. The guys would all be envious. The girls would all want to be with me with that car. Well, it was not to be. The oil embargo hit. And uh, one day, my father came home, took me aside, said, I, I need to talk to you. And of course, I'm a teenager going, what did I do wrong now? And he said, I had to sell the charger. I said, what do you mean? He said, it's the right thing to do for our family. It's the right thing to do for the country. I had to sell the charger. So I remember this oil shock, the oil embargo, very, very dramatically. And I'm sure you all have uh, stories about that yourself. What happened was the price of oil and natural gas at the time went up more than threefold. That was a huge shock to the nation. And not too long afterwards, in 1979, we had a similar energy shock. And at the time, uh, I had just started working for ExxonMobil. And instead of working, I worked uh, uh, designing, this comes into effect a little bit later, ethylene compressors and was an expert on that. And uh, instead of designing them for the Gulf Coast, I was uh, sent off to uh, Al Jabal in, in Saudi Arabia, uh, which at the time was nothing than a small, sleepy port town on the Red Sea with just desert. And I said, you got to be kidding me. We're going to build a plant here? Anyways, we did. And again, that was a very sizable shock, a twofold increase. Years later, there's been many reports done. And 30% of all manufacturing companies disappeared in North America as a direct result of these energy shocks. So it had a very, very dramatic impact on all of us and certainly the manufacturing industry. Now back to the future. And I apologize. I'm using some slides for Marcellus instead of Utica. Just happened to have some neat ones in Marcella. So uh, we, we've seen an explosion in the oil and gas industry and in drilling wells and being extremely productive. And these are the production figures for Marcellus that continue to go up and up and up. Important point is that really in, in 2008, there was no production. And a few short years later, Marcellus Field alone outproduces all the natural gas fields in Saudi Arabia combined. People don't recognize that. That's not carried in the media. This is a tremendous change that's occurred. And so what that's caused is what I call the shale shock. And we have had a significant decrease in natural gas prices, certainly very close to what we've seen due to the OPEC oil embargoes. And I believe it's going to have the same impact on manufacturing. We have a potential for a sizable increase in manufacturing ahead of us. 
Now let's talk a little bit about the North American advantage. And here we are in 2008. You can see the global natural gas prices. This is from the World Bank pink sheet. And we're right around $10 per million BTU. Europe's very close to that. Look at the Middle East, uh, $1.30. And of course, Asia a little bit higher. A couple of years later, what happened? Well, um, North American prices decreased dramatically. Now we're at roughly $2.70 per million BTU. Uh, the important thing to note is our manufacturing competitors in Europe and Asia are significantly higher, several times higher. They haven't had the benefits of the shale revolution. And look at the Middle East, now averaging over $3 or $3 per million BTU. Their prices have increased. We have a speaker later on who's going to talk about um, exporting natural gas, liquefied natural gas. One of the key points I want to make is if we do export liquefied natural gas, and I hope we do so, there's still a significant barrier to having our overseas manufacturing competitors gain access to our low natural gas prices. It costs roughly $5 per million BTU to compress, liquefy, ship in special tankers that product overseas. So we will always have that advantage here in North America for our manufacturing companies. Quick slide on the Middle East. So Middle East, we all think of, I certainly do, uh, as unlimited oil and natural gas resources. Well, that's not so. Uh, there was an article about a year ago on uh, the conundrum of Middle East countries, and specifically Kuwait. Kuwait has been a natural gas importer since 2008. And you go, well, how can that be? They have such abundant resources. Well, they do have abundant resources, but their population, like the rest of the Middle East, has been growing in double digits for many decades now. And they subsidize electricity, which is produced from natural gas, as well as water, desalinized water from the Red Sea, to their citizens. And they use a lot of water. They grow uh, special grains for their polo ponies in the middle of the desert using water. So they're using a lot of electricity, which uses a lot of natural gas. And why do they use natural gas for that? Because they can export the oil easily and cheaply. Natural gas is harder to export. So in this case, Kuwait has run out of it. Saudi Arabia has said they have no more natural gas or ethane available for any new projects in the country. And the similar statements are echoed by almost every single Middle East country. So back to shale gas. Shale gas um, is not just natural gas or methane that heats our homes, that provides us with uh, uh, power via electricity. It's also some other hydrocarbons, ethane, propane, butane, and so on. Why is this important? Well, for the chemical industry, that's the feedstock. That's the raw material. That's what allows them to make products. And of course, the methane, natural gas, is the fuel. So we'll see, for many chemicals, 80% of their costs are wrapped up in chemical feedstocks as well as the fuel. And if North America continues to have natural gas prices and these other hydrocarbons at one-third of the manufacturing competitors in the chemical industry, 80% uh, of their costs, well, you can do the math. It is significant and sizable competitive advantage. And certainly, we've seen this in statements from many global chemical companies. And I've stopped keeping track of this because it's the same thing over and over and over again. One of the ones that's really interesting here is the, is the quote from the uh, uh, COO of the uh, National Petrochemical uh, Industrial Company at Saudi Arabia, which is saying that, hey, uh, our feedstock cost for crackers is at $6 per million BTU new projects. That's significant. And we are at roughly, what, 276 right now? <laughs> These countries and companies that are global all know what's happening in North America and are all very envious. And you'll see a little bit later 
are all rapidly trying to build projects here in North America as a result. So this is from the American Chemistry Council, and this is uh, last year's report, September 2014. I had hoped their most recent report would be available yet, but they're delayed by about a month. Um, so it shows some pretty sizable numbers, $125 billion in capital investment. It's hard to grasp that. A couple of important things here. 64% of that uh, investment is from foreign companies. And that's pretty close. I do consulting. My company does consulting for chemical companies as well as downstream. And that's pretty close to the ratio for, for our customers. They are overseas customers. They know what's happening. They're afraid of it. They're moving here. And they are putting their money down. The other thing is the growth from the 2013 report to the 2014 report is more than 50%. So we've seen in, in, in one year these numbers up dramatically. And if the, when these investments are fully on board, the U.S. chemical industry in a very few years will have increased its capacity by more than 60 percent, 60 percent more chemicals. It's staggering. And of course, these, these companies, and I won't go through that, are doing all sorts of other activities that, that that we haven't seen in decades. Increased merger and acquisition, joint venture activities, uh, entirely new tax structures, new technologies uh, for, for chemical processing that we haven't seen. Um, things like ethane imp imports and exports, which didn't exist before. Let me get a little bit specific and talk about ethylene and, and why ethylene, why crackers, and why are they important. Ethylene is the number one chemical produced globally, both in terms of dollar value and volume. It's a building block chemical. And we'll talk a little bit later about what it goes into. There are two predominant ways that it's produced today. You can produce it from methane on the left, and you produce 75% of, of, of the output of the cracker plant will be ethylene. The rest of it, mostly is, is fuel gas that you use to heat the, the, the cracking furnaces. And most companies also take the, the butadiene and propylene, don't separate it out, and also use that as, as uh, fuel gas in those furnaces. Naphtha, the one on the right, is a different feedstock. It is a lightly refined crude oil, if you will. They just put crude oil in your mind. And when you use that, you get many different products. You only get 25% of the output of the plant producing ethylene. You get other products, such as butadiene, propylene, aromatics, that have uses in the chemical industry. The difference is, if you have a naphtha cracker, you need to separate out those other products to get value. So it costs you 30 to maybe 35 percent more capital to build one of those plants. So it's very desirable, if you have cheap ethane, to build from an ethane feedstock. Now, let me go through some of these economics, and don't worry about this. Don't have to scribble anything down. If you want, I have more details available. Leave me a business card. Uh, I a, did a white paper with PricewaterhouseCoopers that goes through this in depth that you can look at later. So here we have the U.S. and China, and the U.S. has a ethane cracker, and China is doing a naphtha cracker, and um, $2.60 uh, for U.S. natural gas, and we see China at $54 a barrel, pretty much where we are today. And uh, the point, and of course, uh, labor costs in, in, in China a fraction of what they are for the U.S. But we can see we can produce that ethylene at more than two times cheaper than they could be produced in China. That's huge. This is an industry, the chemical industry, that's willing to spend tens, even hundreds of million dollars for 1% efficiency gain. And now they have over a two-fold economic advantage. Take, that is a very, very dramatic cost shift. And it really gets back to what we all considered in the industry to be the, the, the normal. And that occurred after the OPEC oil embargo and the raised prices for oil. We saw that the Middle East, the, the, uh, the bottom uh, oval 
was half the price in terms of, of cost of producing ethylene than the rest of the world. Now we're in the new normal where North America is half the price of the rest of the world. And here I show the Middle East, and those are the existing plants that have existing contracts for low-priced ethane and natural gas. The new plants will be very close to the European, Chinese, and Japanese costs. So there's not an incentive anymore to build in the Middle East. The incentive is all in North America. Now let's take this into a product, polyethylene. Polyethylene is the number one plastic uh, by dollar volume and value. Um, taking those economics straight through. And by the way, I allow for a profit margin here, typical profit margins for, for these companies that they have had historically. Um, and we can see how the, the low-cost shale feedstock translates directly through to making that plastic uh, twofold. Uh, Advantage versus China, and taking this through to make a plastics part. This is a uh, study that I did for a customer that was looking perhaps at, at, at building overseas, and they found out they can make the product for one and a half times cheaper than they could make it in China. This is huge. Remember Dave's picture of that house, and you see all these parts, and the things that you've touched today. You've you've used a toothpaste. Uh, toothpaste, uh, and your toothbrush. Um, you've got a badge that's made out of plastics. You've got a pen that's made out of plastics. 90% of those products are made in China today. Now, we can make them cheaper here in North America with our wage rates. This is enormous. This is, this is I, I can't emphasize enough how groundbreaking these kind of changes are in terms of global economics. And we've seen the chemical industries understand that. And now we're going to see a wave of companies, not only chemical industries, but those plastics processing plants being built to take that product and make it into something that you and I consume, as well as we can export. Again, another busy chart, but we can see shale gas over the left. We see it going to methane, ethane, propane, butane and then into the building block chemicals like ethylene and into various products and markets. The point is it impacts 98% of manufactured products. It's everywhere. So this stuff, the shale gas, really is going to impact everything in our lives. And that's why a few years ago, Andrew Liveris, the CEO of Dow, made this statement, the greatest development of the modern era CEOs of companies are not usually given to making grandiose statements. So it's pretty remarkable. It's a long-term competitive advantage for U.S.-based companies. Absolutely. The advantage will stay here in North America. Now let's talk about the opportunity from a cracker point of view. It's highly profitable. Uh, Dow, in their statements, annual statements year after year says, hey, we're getting an extra $2 billion to the bottom line due to shale gas prices and our ability to produce products in the Gulf Coast. That's huge. It's a multi-decades advantage. We've seen shale gas technology and how to produce it move offshore, China, Argentina, Poland, so on. What we haven't seen is those countries be able to take that technology and economically produce shale gas, even though they've had it now for more than 10 years. There are significant barriers that are due to the geology, the, the, the structure of which the companies uh, regulate, legislate, um, mineral rights, many water availability, many different issues. So it's going to stay in North America. And North America has really compared to investments elsewhere that these ke global chemical companies are doing or global plastics processing companies are doing has a very low risk. We have a low political risk. The, the, the political machine, as we've seen, tends to move slowly, which is a good thing. It tends to understand business much more so than other countries. Wouldn't you rather invest here in North America if you could than China 
or say the Middle East? Absolutely. We have also acceptance of the chemical industry. We have a very high manufacturing productivity. And one of the interesting things is that's appearing now is, is, is competition for, for, and market share. These companies, these global chemical companies, it, it's almost like uh, uh, one-upsmanship. Um, they all watch one another. So when PPT made the announcement uh, for a cracker plant here in Ohio, their chief competitor in Thailand just made an announcement for uh, investigating a cracker plant in Louisiana. So we'll see that. They're afraid that they're going to let their competitors get advantage. They were thinking about it, but as these investments go forward, this is going to push them to move ahead. I recently had an opportunity to be at a black tie event to uh, honor somebody in the industry. And I was at uh, a table where there was the um, VP of strategy for Nova Chemicals. I think Nova is number three or number four in, in uh, polyethylene and ethylene production in North America. And sitting next to me was the president of Exxon Chemicals. And they were talking about you know, their investments um, in North American capacity increases. And the VP of Nova Chemicals said, you know, once you guys announced that investment, we had to move forward. And I asked him, why was that? He was referring to the Exxon Chemical announcement. He said, because we'll lose market share to Exxon. We can't have that. It's a road that is it, that eventually has an end that we'll have to get out of the business. I said, how is that? He said, it's, it's small, but over time, it starts to add up. They have more market share. They have more revenue, which they can spread their R&D, their administrative costs, their sales team, their customer service, and so on. They have more revenue in the future so they can build more plants to get more market share. And therefore, they're going to continue to increase. If we want to be in the business, we have to stay put. We have to increase our capacity as well. Kind of interesting. I've been in the industry now for 30 years, and that always is amazing to me. Let's talk about the Appalachian location, why it's so interesting. Um, there's a huge benefit for avoiding transportation costs, and that's transportation costs both in, in moving the natural gas and ethane down to the plants, many of which historically have been located in the Gulf Coast. Now, we only have to move them a few short miles away. Also, customers for the end product are local. Akron, Canton area, was the birthplace of the U.S. plastics polymer industry, which came from the tire and rubber industry. And within a 250-mile radius, still 50% of the U.S. North American, I should say, not just U.S. plastics processing exists. So there's a, a, a base of customers that are local. When you add those two up, depending on, upon the scale of the plant, you know, there's hundreds of millions potentially in saving your transportation costs. That's huge. It's one of the reasons why they want to locate here. The other one is, and we'll see this later, there's a lot of bottlenecks right now of the Gulf Coast in terms of available land, uh, rail capacity, barge capacity, electric, getting permits, and so on. That didn't exist years ago, exists here. We saw previously, uh, with the previous speaker, there are a lot of great brownfield sites available, sites that have that road, rail, electric, barge. That's a big thing to these companies. And this works also very well when a company is just working initially just to go ethane to ethylene to polyethylene, one set of products, which gets back to the ethane cracker um, issue. And we also have the reduced capital if you're going to build a cracker that's just based on ethane. So here are some of the issues in the Gulf Coast. I, I'll um, not go through them in detail, but they, they've historically had a huge advantage. That advantage is shifting now to, to the known uh, bottleneck issues. You'll see this. The, the CEOs of chemical companies are, are uh, talking about this on a very regular basis, uh, it, it, trying to do something about the railroads, uh, which, is, which is causing real problems, barge, port capacity. Um, the whole area in the Gulf Coast is really an EPA 
non-attainment area, so any new plant is, is very, very strict in terms of uh, uh, potential emissions and permitting. Why do cracker plants take so long? Why are they so difficult to get started? I talked about all the, all the money a, a cracker plant can generate, and they're extremely profitable. But there are a number of challenges. The first and foremost is, and, and I tell my clients and, and chemical companies that are looking to build cracker plants, there are some here that you just got to get comfortable with. There's no way out of. These are billion dollar bet the company and bet your career kind of decisions. And you know, you, you think about a big company like a PPT or Shell, there is an individual in that company who's spearheading it and they know their career is on the line. It's usually a senior executive is looking to, this is my legacy, I, I'm probably not going to move forward in the company but I want to leave something behind so what the heck I believe in this. But they know they're betting their career and they know they're betting the company. We, we saw PPT as, as an example, the 85th largest company in the Forbes list. But that uh, cracker plant that they're building, that's equivalent to more than five years of their annual capital expenditures. That means they cannot pursue other projects. It's consuming such a huge amount of money, even for these multi-billion dollar organizations. And if you're an overseas company like PPT, there's a lot of political pressure on you. You're the national champion. You've only had plants in your country. Now you're going overseas. Government's doing some arm twisting on those companies, saying, we want you to invest here. Companies are also very fearful of the uh, dollar. Um, dollar is often a safe haven. <laughs> you see as tensions rise, people come to the US. The Fed is talking about an interest rate rise. Um, so companies are, are wondering what's going to happen with the dollar exchange rate. None of us can influence that. So again, that's one of the ones I say, that's something you just got to live with. There's some of the challenges that can be, that, that can be mitigated by both time and money. Uh, trained workers, we, we often hear this as trained workers as an excuse. Trained workers is, is, is a problem on the Gulf Coast for the chemical plants as well. Um, years ago, they've developed a solution. They've worked with the local and state governments. They've worked with the uh, local community colleges. They've spent time and money, and they've gotten together curriculums for these community colleges called the chemical industry curriculum. Some companies even have their special add-on, like uh, DuPont has a special couple extra courses that they'll do on a curriculum. Um, they will pay students to attend. They will give students even living money. In turn, they want a four-year commitment afterwards. That they'll stay with the company. But it's a good public-private partnership. That has to occur here. The cracker companies have to get involved and make that happen as well. I could go on and on on that. Um, it, it's a fascinating change from the way things were 20 years ago. And we've seen, and it was mentioned previously, a 30% rise in construction costs. Because of all these plants being built, we are pulling specialty steel, specialty pro uh, computer equipment, specialty uh, trained workers, not only from um, elsewhere in the US, but elsewhere in the world. And it's a pretty, pretty premium that has to be paid to get these people here. There's no way out of it. We've got shortages. The midstream sector with the separation plants is pulling on the same workers, specialty steel, computer processing equipment that the chemical industry will be pulling on. There are some items that there is no real easy way out. And, you know, the cracker companies, if you build in the Gulf Coast, you're very you're, you're going to be close to an ethane pipeline because there's an ethane pipeline everywhere there. There's huge underground ethane storage. That doesn't exist here. So you're a cracker company. You want to sign a contract, and you want to have a short supply of ethane. So you go to the midstream guys, and you go to the, the E&P guys and say, I want ethane. They say, great. Sign a contract, 30 years. Here it is. Take or pay. So I have a 30-year liability. Yup. That doesn't exist in the Gulf Coast. Oh, and I want to guarantee that you'll be able to supply me the ethane. And they go, well, you know, other than act of God and to our best efforts, and they're going, no, 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 no. I, I, you know, act of God, that matters to you. I will not be able to run my plant if something happens to your plant. 
how about some methane storage? They're saying, no, you pay for that. So this is something that still has to get solved and is, is a big issue and a big bottleneck. Similarly, ethylene pipelines and storage, uh, we want to store that. Some ethylene in case there's a hiccup in the plant and be able to transport that ethylene short distances to potentially another chemical downstream user. All of these challenges and risks add to delays, more resources being required, and increase the rate of return that the, the board of directors is asking for these projects. So far, the rate of returns are exceptional. That's not a problem. These companies are willing to throw the resources at it. Um, delays are just what they are. Another one that's kind of interesting when they talk about, you know, oil to natural gas price. And this is, to make some assumptions, a rough curve, but here we can see oil price on the left side, natural gas at the right side. If you're going to make ethylene, this is sort of, you know, if you have $4 per million BTU natural gas price, that's roughly crude oil at $38 a barrel. That would be parity. That would be a decision, well, I don't know which way I want to make my ethylene. I could use it via the naphtha route or I could use it via the ethane route. As you can see, there's probably no potential scenario that anybody can think of for natural gas prices going much beyond $6 per million BTU, but there are plenty of scenarios where we can see, uh, and it, as exists today, crude oil being above that parity line. So ethane, natural gas, crackers are always going to be more economic. And speaking of crude oil, this is a chart over on the right. It was done by the economist, uh, some interesting data. And basically, we know that many governments, Saudi Arabia, Russia, Libya, and so on, live off of their exports of crude oil. This is what funds the governments, keeps the wheels turning, and so on. And, you know, at $50 a barrel crude oil, there's no government, no country that continue to run their government. So what they're doing is they're using reserves, there's you know currency devaluations, reduction sub subsidies, recessions, and so on. Eventually something's got to give. One of these countries, I believe there'll be social unrest, and that crude oil will come out of the system as, as the wheels fly off. Another uh, eye straining chart, and I like to use charts in my discussions with my clients from other companies because it just, uh, I've done a similar one, but it, it just verifies what I'm talking about. A um, couple important things, the, the first, the bottom red, that is the ethane being used in existing facilities in Canada. The bottom light blue is existing ethane facilities in North America, and then you can see all the new crackers and expansions in the little bands up above it that's consuming ethane. The point is the very top line is the maximum potential ethane that could be gotten out of the natural gas streams today. So there's plenty of headroom for many more plants. You know, maybe as much as a dozen more plants. This is even assuming we don't drill and get any more natural gas out of the ground. So ethane availability is a non-issue. Another question that cracker companies always go, well, all this expansion, all this ethylene, where's it all going? Who's consuming it? How come we haven't seen prices cave in yet in North America? Well, kind of interesting. A lot of these plants in the Gulf Coast are 30 plus years old. Um, they're not really capable of running at the capacity that which they were originally built at. Um, that hasn't been a problem in the past because we haven't needed the capacity. But now, because they're so profitable, they're trying to run them full out and recognizing they can't run full out. Also, a lot of the newer plants with newer technology, the upgrades, the feedstock switches, it takes time to get these things working correctly. They're not yet. Um, and we also have a number of plants that are not running a pure ethane feedstock. We saw that naphtha picture, and one of the products being produced is butadiene which is a, a, a co-product in that a, a naphtha cracker. Well, because the plants in North America switched very heavily towards ethane, 
Uh, butadiene has become a short, there's been a shortage um, and even force majeure situation in butadiene where we've seen butadiene prices go up by more than 500%. So some companies have found it pretty profitable to, to stick uh, some butane in their ethane feedstock and produce butadiene out of these uh, crackers. And we're seeing exports in ethylene derivatives. By derivatives, I mean the downstream products, chemical products, such as polyethylene, start to take off. And uh, in the future, we're going to see us making the finished products, the ballpark pens, the, 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 the syringes, the IV bags, the uh, name badges, all that stuff in the picture, and exporting those products as well. The other thing that people don't understand is the chemical industry is a global market. And we take a look at Asia and the Asian middle class. And, you know, 2009, Asian middle class was a little bit less than, than Europe, a little bit greater than North America. Uh, by 2020, uh, it'll certainly be five, six fold of that in North America. And uh, even in the future, it's going to increase at a very rapid pace. These middle class consumers consume durable goods, they're going to consume and want the same houses, same cars, same washing machines, same plastic products as we have here in North America. That's going to be a continuing source of demand. And if you've ever been in Asia recently, I got a chance to go two years ago in China, it is very dramatic. You look at these housing developments in the same exact house, you can just see it for miles. It's no end. 56 lane uh, highways in China. It, it's insane. And uh, so there is a huge demand for these products. They're going to be made here in North America. We're going to be the manufacturing and chemical hub for the world. I'll talk about the Appalachian Cracker and get to that. And really, I, I group these, these companies in, in three major groups. The, the large global players, the new company single product, and, and what I call the local champion. So uh, example, large global player is Shell. The probability of Shell moving ahead is excellent. Um, or if any one of the major companies like Shell would, would, would seek to build a cracker here, um, I would think it would have a very good chance of moving ahead. There's very few companies, however, um, that ha of these multinationals other than Shell that hasn't already built a new cracker or a greatly expanded capacity here in North America. So you're it's unlikely to see another player in the near future announce here for an Appalachian cracker, even though it's advantaged. And Nuco single product, you know, Appalachian resins we talked about, do they have a lot of barriers to overcome? I think the probability of any of these moving ahead is, is low. However, there are a number of companies that are in the background, like Appalachian resins, that may come forward. So just the, the number of these says that, hey, we might see another one of them moving forward. Maybe not now, maybe sometime in the future. And then there's the local champions, Brass Chem, PPT. These are the companies that know they have to get out of their home country and their home country markets, and they see a great opportunity here in North America. Probability is sort of in between the last two, but there are a lot of these companies. A lot of them are billion-dollar companies. They have the structure and capability to do this. They have the technology. They understand the products, but they're new to North America. So I think we're going to see, uh, if I was a betting man, more of these as potentials for an Appalachian cracker. How many will end up in Appalachia? I don't know. Um, certainly, I think by uh, the end of 2020, you know, I think we'll probably have three or four moving ahead. My guess. If I could bet that in Vegas, I don't know if I would, but uh, it's, 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 it's really hard to tell sometimes. And we see that example with Braskem and what happened there. Uh, Braskem, uh, parent company, Odebrecht, um, the CEO got tangled in a political scandal and is uh, in jail right now um, in Brazil. It's a big political issue, and uh, all the projects for Braskem are basically on hold. So. These events can happen that nobody can foresee. 
Let me talk about two other kind of crackers, two other opportunities that haven't appeared that I think will appear that are pretty exciting. One is a concept called condo cracker. So that is where multiple companies, might be three, four, five, or more, invest in, hey, we want to build a big cracker together. And why is that interesting? Well, they get economies of scale. Right? They all benefit from a larger facility. So if you double, say, the size of a cracker, it doesn't cost you twice as much investment. It may only cost you 60% more investment for double the capacity. So that's why they like to be big. It's also a lower incremental capacity for you to sell. So you have less product to sell. Before, you'd have to be a certain size. Now you can be a smaller size. All this stuff adds up to less risk. The cons, of course, are you got to get agreement with multiple parties, which is often difficult. This works well when companies don't compete for their end use of ethylene. Say one is making polyethylene, another glycol ether, ethanolamine, or whatever. So they're not natural competitors. So what's the big deal in, in cooperating? It's mostly about timing. And I think we're going to see some investments as, as condo crackers moving ahead. The other one is, is sort of a, I call a landlord supplier. So the one ad reads, major ethylene producer seeks customers to co-locate in the site. This is one of the reasons why chemical companies like Shell like to have a very, very big site. And I think Shell fits into this, where they're looking to have some other potential consumers of ethylene that make products that Shell doesn't make be on their site. The tenants would get very close to the economics that Shell gets. They'd get the land, utilities provided, um, you know, reduce capital requirements, reduce risk. As a landlord, Shell gets to build a bigger plant, spread the cost of utilities, gets nice consistent cash flow, captive customers for decades, reduces risk all around. Again, these deals take time to put in place. So let's take a look at some of the typical milestones. And these are in no particular order, and many of these run uh, simultaneously. And you know, from Shell's example, they've moved ahead on a number of these items, including some uh, investments well over a $100 million range, like uh, the feed engineering and, and, and site, obtaining the site. At the same time, while the project in, uh, outside of Pittsburgh was announced, Shell also canceled delayed a number of projects, most recently Arctic drilling. Um, we've also seen the, the big uh, sea lion uh, drilling projects uh, offshore, uh, off of Argentina, Falklands area, uh, being postponed. Uh, their big Al Karana uh, project with Qatar, they've been partners with Qatar for 40 plus years. They pulled out of this because of poor economics. What they didn't say is poor economics over there and better economics over here in North America. In the announcement, they pulled out of the Louisiana gas to liquids. That's taking natural gas and producing gasoline. Uh, they pulled out of the uh, Cameron Creek project in, in Canada, tar sands. So Shell is not shy, as these other companies, to withdraw from projects that they feel are uneconomic. And they're continued with their project here in uh, Appalachian Basin. So, you've seen part of this chart before, shale gas going into the hydrocarbons, which goes into the basic building blocks. We talked about ethane, ethylene. Uh, one thing I do want to mention is not just polyethylene, but all these other, and this is just part of the list of ethylene derivatives, products that can be made from ethylene. And each one of these is a billion dollar facility. So once the ethylene plants get built, companies tend to expand them. They tend to attract these other consumers of ethylene. And you're in a virtuous cycle of more and more production, more and more chemical plants. Uh, and they are you know, at very, very significant scale. Not only that, but we forgot to talk about some of the other building block chemicals and we get too carried away with crackers and crackers are, uh, are very sexy for the chemical industry but these other ones are as well so ammonia methanol uh, propylene and and so forth um, let me talk about two um, first off ammonia where does ammonia go uh, ammonia gets used as a 
chemical intermediary, make lots of products, but most of it goes to make fertilizer. Ohio is located in a very good spot. It has the natural gas coming from the wells, Utica and Marcellus. It's also close to the bread basket, which needs a lot of fertilizer. The interesting thing is 40% of our fertilizer today is imported. So we're going to see a lot more ammonia and a lot more fertilizer plants. These again are, you know, billion dollar plants at a time. Same with methanol, 50% is imported. It was recently a kind of interesting. Methanex uh, had a had a uh, big facility in, in Chile, and uh, they announced they're shutting down the Chile plant. They're actually taking it apart and rebuilding it here in, uh, I believe it's Louisiana. We're going to see a lot more of those occur as well. So don't think just ethane crackers. Think of the derivatives and also think of these other building block chemicals. So my conclusions is this is a global industry revolution caused by the shale gas revolution. Chemicals manufacture products, we are at a tipping point that most people don't see today. The chemical industry sees it. They know it's happening. They're making the investments. They're putting their dollars forward. We're at the crux of a revolution in manufacturing in North America due to our advantage shale gas. It's huge, it's disruptive, and offers big opportunities. Let me, let me speak a little bit about how disruptive it is. Um, and, and plastics are you know, everywhere today. Uh, go to a supermarket tomorrow or go to your local Home Depot or home supply store. Take a look at the shelves. Take a look at how many of the products are in glass jars or metal cans. And come back in five years and see how many of those are there. They won't be. Um, this summer, I, uh, as I have to do every so often, I had to pressure treat the deck and then restain it. Uh, it's pressure treated wood and uh, pin the neck. Um, the composite wood, like Trex, which uses plastics, has the potential for being lower priced than wood for the decks and fencing. That's a huge disruptive change. Will companies like Warehouser that only make wood, they don't make the plastic products, they'll be even aware of some of these changes that takes business away from them in a very short and quick time. We're going to see that everywhere with other materials that you wouldn't think plastics would go. I was at, at a new hotel here, the, the Hyatt, um, last night, and uh, Dave, uh, Dave and I had dinner, and he picked me up. I said, Dave, look around the hotel. Look at this floor. It's, 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 a, uh, it's a chemical. The floor looks like tile. It's actually a laminate. Same thing as laminate countertops. Wears well and that kind of stuff. Take a look at the, at the wood surrounding the, the front desk. That's not wood. That's a laminate. That's a plastic. Take a look at um, the, 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 the sink in the bathroom. That's, that is a, a fake quartz countertop. All this stuff is changing, and this is not cheap plastics anymore. Most people can't tell them from, from wood or tile, but they're cheaper to produce, and they're only become far cheaper to produce in the future. So with that, I'd like to leave you with questions. Uh, my company, Topline Analytics, we're a small consulting company. Uh, we help not only the chemical plants, but also the downstream companies like the plastics processing companies, private equity, state, local governments, foreign governments to try to understand what's going on and try to get prepared for the, uh, the opportunities of the future. With that, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Please, please raise your hand if you have questions. Um, I'd like to ask you, oh, um, let's go to Dan here. Uh, Tom, uh, we've had our first students come from Saudi Arabia and uh, on behalf of Aramco and their advisor visited last week and he mentioned the Appalachian Basin was very big in their plans for the future and he looked at us, he looked at Akron, he looked at uh, Marietta and I was 
thinking to myself uh, is the main challenge for for the Middle East as far as shale gas is it a is it a midstream infrastructure issue or is it that they don't have the geology and I should know the geology answer and I don't I have to look that up but uh, do you have any insight into where their struggle is you touched on it as far as why they won't be going to the gas yeah, I a number of different reasons. Okay, so so let's take Saudi Arabia as an example. And Saudi Arabia um, had a program a couple of years ago to exploit shale gas and be very active. Um, and they have since uh, scaled that back very, very dramatically. First off, their ge geology is not um, as desirable and easy to get out of the ground as it is here. Second off, it requires still a lot of water. Where are they going to get that from? Um, third, you've seen that the slide that I have, Marcellus, of the number of wells. So shale gas and shale oil, you need to drill a lot of wells compared to the historical uh, well drilling. For a while there, Marcellus had more active rigs than all of Saudi, all of the Middle East combined, just to give you an idea of the scale. So you need a lot of workers, a lot of rigs. That doesn't exist. Um, and you start adding up all these things and all these costs, they start to realize that it, there's cheaper ways for them to get natural gas, in this case, importing from Qatar, than drilling it themselves. By the way, that's uh, Dan Schweitzer. He directs the oil and gas training program at Stark State College. Another question from the audience anywhere? Um, Tom, I'd like you to comment on the timeline of many of the things you're talking about. Would take, it'll take many years to build one of these major cracker plants, let alone the cohabitated uh, um, uh, customer plants uh, and the fertilizer plants and all that. So will we be seeing this five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now? What, what are the timelines on some of the uh, revolutionary changes that you're talking about? So first off, um the changes are going to happen a lot quicker than that. The Gulf Coast plants, the Gulf Coast ones, have a jump on it because they already are being built at existing facilities. They have existing air permits. They have existing workers. They have existing ethane storage and so on. So the chemical companies invested there first. Those plants are coming on stream. The capacity is coming on stream. Those plastics process uh, plastics, uh, as a result, coming out of there will be coming here into this area for plastics processing because that's where the plastics processing companies are. They are not in Texas. They're not in Louisiana. They're in this region. So that's going to be happening uh, next year or two. We're already seeing plastic processing plants um, in North America appear probably one per month, if not one and a half per month new plants come in. So um, we're going to see that start to accelerate as plastics prices start dropping and it becomes more economical. Uh, if I was 20 years younger, I'd uh, get some venture fund money and, and be in that business myself. But um, so that will be the first thing. Now, the crackers themselves, uh, Shell will probably be the first one. They're a couple years away. Once one gets built, um, the impetus for the next one gets easier because the workers that we're in the construction phase and so on, get freed up and now available for the next plant. There's demonstrated uh, capability to do this in this region. The risk profile goes down for the next player. They'll move faster than Shell did. Um, you talked about the growth of the Asian middle class. Uh, and I presume that that was directly related to the market for all of these uh, plastics products that can be manufactured in the United States. Do you, uh, do you worry about any sort of trade barriers to getting those goods to those people, or, or do you believe that the demand will, will uh, outweigh the, uh, the politics in those situations? Yeah, you know, a real interesting question. And uh, you, uh, let's take China as an example. And, and China is sort of the, the bellwether for this whole thing, uh, and it remains to be played out. Last month, uh, a very important demographic uh, issue occurred, and that is China now will have less workers coming into the market every day for the next 20 years. Remember, they had that one-child policy, so they're past the bubble. 
even now if they tell everybody, you know, go make three children, five children, whatever, you know, that'll take 20 years till they get workers there. So they'll have less and less workers. So um, their wage rates will go up. They'll seek to go up the scale, make more and more complicated products. I think some of the simpler products, some of the chemical processing stuff, they'll be happy to have those imports uh, coming from North America. In addition, if you take a look at from the North American producer point of view, the plastics that are going to be made here are first going to eliminate exports, imports from China, right? We're going to transplant that stuff, that toothbrush, that ballpoint pen, that name badge that was imported from China. It'll now be made here in, the, in North America. And then the next thing is we'll go to more local markets such as uh, Central and South America and so on before moving into, into China. So that's at least a decade, if not longer, away that we would have sizable exports to China, my guess.